Bundy and Camp 1983 and this now is the 5.30 study period on Tuesday afternoon the last one of course for today we closed our last study period talking about the uh, way in which Satan was able to use John the Baptist's disciples to discourage and dishearten him at a time when, when he needed to have very clear encouragements in regard to the principles of God's kingdom now it's worth our while to notice that um, the, the disciples of John the Baptist did not experience the, um, the same development of character that John the Baptist himself had experienced because they did not spend the same time in prayer and communion with God that he did. For instance, let's compare the two pictures. John the Baptist for 30 solid years devoted himself to a deep and thorough preparation for his life work. And then when he finally began to preach for the first time his disciples, those who became his disciples later, began to absorb the wonderful truths of the gospel and to accept the teaching which John brought to them. But the duration of John's ministry was was less than a year. So even if those men had spent a lot of time in very, very close communion with God, it would have been one year on their part versus something like 30 years in John the Baptist's part. Now, obviously, of course, 30 years of communion with God, because John the Baptist did have communion from his very earliest days, and more and more as he became a, an, in, uh, an individual, perhaps, uh, perhaps 30 years a bit, bit wasn't, was a bit more than he really did have, but um, less thing in terms of John's entire life, his mother and father's training, and so forth, being a thorough preparation for his life work, now, will 30 years of very close communion with God do more for you in one year or less than one year of it? Very obviously. And therefore, the experience of John the Baptist's disciples did not by any means measure up to his own experience. And that's why they were more ready to express doubts in regard to Christ's mission than was the Baptist himself. Now, this brought to John a very, very deep and, and fearful trial which, um, well, I wouldn't say it came close to destroying his faith in God, but certainly caused some very, very real questions to develop in the mind of John the Baptist. We cannot say there were sins, because there's, there's no sin about uh, grappling with questions which are difficult to understand or to answer. And, of course, we come to camp meeting, and very often we come with a whole list of questions in our minds, and again and again I found people say even in this camp that uh, the questions they brought with them are being answered as they hear the messages being presented which indicates of course a coordination of work between the preparation of the mind and the preparation of the preaching for a camp meeting. Now I won't take time to um, read all of the next two paragraphs I'll just simply summarise them quickly and um, John's expectation was that Christ would take the throne of David but as time passed he saw Christ making no move to step into that position he had looked for the high places to be cast down and uh, thought that this would be done as it was back in the days of King Josiah when the scriptures were rediscovered but, but he, he, he felt that what was happening in the life of Jesus Christ was not fulfilling the prophecies as he knew those prophecies and so he became very, very deeply troubled and perplexed. As so now we on page 216 in the same book, Desire of Ages. To the desert prophets, all this seemed a mystery beyond his fathoming. There were hours when the whisperings of demons tortured his spirit and the shadow of a terrible fear crept over him. Could it be that the long hope for deliverer had not yet appeared? Then what meant the message that he himself had been impelled to bear? John had been bitterly disappointed in the results of his mission. He had expected that the message from God would have the same effect as when the law was read in the days of Josiah and Ezra, and they would follow a deep-seated work of repentance and returning unto the Lord. For the success of this mission, his whole life had been sacrificed had it been in vain. Of course, it's a great mistake on the part of um, those whom God calls to work for him to have a clear-cut idea in your mind of just what your work is going to be. In the case of John the Baptist, of course, he has certain very definite ideas about the work of the Messiah. In fact, his disciples likewise had uh, definite ideas, and so did Christ's own disciples and the Jewish nation 
have different or most of the same ideas about what that mission is going to be. And when that mission did not turn out to be what they expected it to be, then what did they do? They ought to have realigned their thinking, but instead of that they rejected Jesus Christ completely. Not the disciples of Christ, but, but most of the Jews did. And they ended up crucifying him because he was not what they thought he would be. And um, likewise, we must guard against forming very specific ideas of exactly how God is going to work for us and what he will do. Far better to keep our minds completely open, let God God us as he wishes, let us be completely pliable and submissive to his will. I read again from Christ Topic Lessons, page 363. He would not have us conjecture as to the success of our honest endeavours. That's not our business. What is our business? Our business to ask only two questions. What are my orders and what are the promises? And leave the rest completely in the care of God. And so John the Baptist felt because he had formed certain ideas about his work that his work was a, a miserable failure. He was bitterly disappointed in the results of his mission. And the question plagued his mind, had his work been in vain? And of course that question in the context of a miserable experience in that dungeon became a very powerful question in his mind as one can appreciate. Now read a little further, John was troubled to see that through love for him his own disciples were cherishing unbelief in regard to Jesus. Had his work for them been fruitless? Had he been unfaithful in his mission that he was now cut off from labor? If the promised deliverer had appeared and John had been found true to his calling, would not Jesus now overthrow the oppressor's power and set, it, set for his herald? But the Baptist did not surrender his faith in Christ. The Baptist did not surrender his faith in Christ. Let's go ahead just a little bit to another statement. This time on page 224 right there in the middle of that first paragraph it says he, that is Satan had been unwearied in his efforts to draw away the Baptist from a life of unreserved surrender to God but he had failed now what does what is a life of unreserved surrender to God and link that of course with the statement back here that John did not surrender his faith in Christ so he didn't give up his faith and maintain their life of unreserved surrender to God. Now put those two things together and what have we got? We have obedience and faith, don't we? What is unreserved surrender? Is that obedience? Mm -hmm. I'm sure it is. And if he did not surrender his faith in Christ, then we have obedience and faith. And what do those two things add up to? Holiness. holiness. So then was John a holy man in the true sense of the word, right? And despite this pressure, what did he maintain? He maintained that experience even though he had, he had erroneous ideas in regard to the nature of the kingdom which erroneous ideas led him to regard his own mission as being, being a failure he was bitterly disappointed in his own work and which led him to question the mission of Jesus as well but none of that represented a break in the pattern of holy living and total submission to God's will where was that quote from? the last one I read was from page 200 and uh, 24, 224, Desire of Ages. And I'm back there on page 216 again, where the statement says, But the Baptist did not surrender his faith in Christ. The memory of the voice from heaven and the descending dove, the spotless purity of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit had rested upon him, or upon John, as he came into the Saviour's presence, and the testimony of the prophetic scriptures all witnessed. That Jesus, of Nazareth, that Jesus of Nazareth was the promised one now at this point I want you to consider something quite important um, when we come a little later to uh, the study of the baptism of Jesus Christ and the consecration of Christ and so forth and then when Christ came back from the desert after, after he suffered temptation we find that uh, the, the Holy Spirit spoke very mightily through John and he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now that was a message direct from heaven. John spoke by inspiration, not by his own vision. In fact, 
Jesus was so emaciated, so haggard and worn after his 40 days of starvation that John was able to recognize him only by the inspiration of the Spirit. He was so different, just skin and bones. And it must have taken Christ quite a, Christ quite a long time to rebuild all that wasted tissue. Now, when that message came from heaven through John the Baptist, the multitude were unable to perceive the message and unable to recognize or to see in Jesus Christ the anointed one. But John could see it. Now, why could he see it? Because of those years and years of listening to God's voice and the hours of prayer, he had become aware of heaven's language and of the, of the presence of the divine love that marked the Saviour's power and life. Now, therefore, when it says in this paragraph, the memory of the voice from heaven and the descending dove. Now, John had heard that voice and seen that dove only because back there years of preparation made him capable of reading and seeing that others could not read or see. Now, I suppose that most of you folk have not been in the foreign language area where you don't know a single word of the foreign language, be it Spanish, German, French, whatever the case might be, and you go into this country and because you've had no prior training in that language, all you hear is a, uh, a, a stream of absolutely unintelligible sounds. And it's a very, very helpless feeling which comes over you. You want to communicate, but there's no way in which you can communicate. Every word you say they don't understand, and every word they say in life, many you don't understand either. And that is the way it is with those who have failed to learn heaven's language, who fail to enter into communion with God. When God speaks, they do not hear and do not understand the voice of God. But John the Baptist did. He'd heard that voice from heaven. He had seen the descending dove. He had perceived the spotless purity of, of the Saviour. And he had been conscious of the power of the Holy Spirit resting upon him as he came into the Saviour's presence. And all these things then in the hour of trial and distress were a stay and a strength and a foundation upon which the faith of John the Baptist stood and did not fall. Which once again emphasizes the point that far more important than knowing the truth in every last little detail, we must know some truth of course, is to develop a very close and rich communion with God and which communion forms in us a character after his own, own likeness. The next paragraph tells us that John would not discuss his doubts and anxieties with his companions. Now I greatly appreciate that fact. Now if you've got any doubts in your minds, any darkness, any discouragements, do not talk to other people about those things. The only person that you can talk to about those things is, is perhaps that person who has a great deal more spiritual strength than you've got yourself, so that you do not impart to them your own darkness and discouragement. But the only safe person to whom you can tell those things, of course, is Jesus Christ himself. Now, when you discuss your problems, your darkness, your doubts and your perplexities, your discouragements and so forth with somebody else, then you're, then you're going to lay upon them a burden of discouragement which they are not called upon to bear and which will do neither, neither you nor them any good. Now, when I was in Germany at the camp meeting there, one of the men who... Um, is himself, what is, is a little bit, he still retains some of the old school ideas of um, Adventism and of course in, Ad, in the Adventist church and all the other churches the idea is to have a local minister hovering over a congregation thinking for them, presenting, their, presenting a sermon to them every single week so the people become leaners, they become dependent upon this local minister and take him away and what do you, what, what do you find is their situation, they're floundering aren't they, don't know where they are and this man said that there was not enough personal visitation around the field, that the sick were not getting enough visits and so forth and so on and so on. And I said to him, well, I said, uh, you misunderstand, of course, God's purpose at this time. What God is bringing up at the present time is not a family of babies, but a, a, a company of warriors, of men and women, who have learned to make a personal connection directly with heaven for themselves and who don't need to lean upon other people, they don't need to call in the preacher to do their praying for them, to intercede for them in regard to their sickness, to uplift and comfort them and so forth. And around the world today, 
that is what God is doing. He just hasn't provided a, a large number of ministers to hover over congregations, and I'm very thankful for it. Because, as I said, we'll never, we'll never develop the strength and fitness for our future work if we, if we are leaners upon the experience and power of others. And when that loud cry comes, of course, every one of us is going to be a messenger of God, all those who are faithful, of course. Then will be fulfilled the words in the, in the book of Joel, and it says that there shall be, your young men shall prophesy and so forth. And when that time comes, of course, every one of you who today are in this school will then be leaders in the cause of God. And people, men and women and others, will look for help and guidance, and therefore people who have learned to go to God for themselves in sickness, in need, in discouragement, in darkness, with problems and all those kind of things. And what God does is gives you a message that it is preparing you for the future work and then leaves you at home month after month to develop a strength of character and purpose which cannot be, dis be, be strengthened any, any other way. Now I learnt this lesson when I was just a boy and of course I lived in the country and we had uh, calves and cows and horses and goats and ducks and chickens and so forth and um, we very often uh, would see a mother hen sit on a clutch of eggs and uh, after about three weeks they'd come be happy day when all these stuffy little balls of yellow would emerge from within the shells. I remember one, one occasion where, um, quite early, where the mother hen was um, sitting on these eggs and we, we kept visiting her. She seemed to accept our company after a while <laughs> and <laughs> forgot that we were a threat to her because we were interested in her baby as much as she was. And finally one morning we heard this, uh, this cheep, cheep, cheeping sound and the first chicken was already out. And of course that meant the others were about to follow. And so we waited there with great interest and sure enough in a little while one of the, one of the uh, shells began to vibrate and rattle a little bit and pretty soon we saw a little tiny bill poking out through a, a hole in the shell. And quite a struggle ensued then to break the rest of the shell for this chicken to arrive into the world of sunlight and activity. And... Um, Naturally, we, I reached down to assist the little fellow by breaking the shell open and letting him out. My mother said, don't, don't do it. She said, stop right there. And she told me that um, if I was to deprive that chicken of that struggle to emerge from that shell, I'd deprive of a sense of exercise and that chicken would be a weakling for the rest of his life. Well, I believed and I guess it's true. And that was a lesson which I, I learned at that time, a lesson which taught, and she then told me likewise, at that point in time, I should learn to develop my own personal and spiritual walk with God so I could connect directly with my Savior and not have to go through a whole string of other people, such as ministers and priests or whatever. And it was a very important lesson to me and one which we all need to recognize so far as our development is concerned. And so I'm very, very filled with admiration at John's determination not to discuss his doubts and anxieties with his companions. What did he do? He sent a message to Jesus to ask him for the answers. Now in doing this, his main concern was still not even for himself. His main concern was for his disciples, which demonstrates the fact that those years of communion had built into him the spirit of divine love, as well as the spirit of obedience. So his love for his disciples caused him to think of them first and foremost. He was concerned that um, his situation was causing them to be filled with unbelief, he was concerned too with the fact that, um, that, that perhaps his work for them had been in vain and that he had failed them badly. So when he sent them to Christ, he was more concerned about their experience than he was about their own. And so they went. I read now from page 216. John would not discuss his doubts and anxieties with his companions. He determined to send a message of inquiry to Jesus. This he entrusted to two of his disciples, hoping that an interview with the Saviour would confirm their faith and bring assurance to their brethren. So where was John's thought first and foremost? For himself? No, it was for others. And he longed for some word from Christ spoken directly to, for himself. So those men arrived in the Saviour's presence and Jesus did not give them a direct answer but told them to stand by throughout the entire day to listen to what he had to say and to observe what he had to do. And he sent them back to report what they had seen and heard to John the Baptist. On page 217, we now read the 
line of thought that was now generated in the mind of John the Baptist. I read now on page 217. The disciples bore the message and it was enough. John recalled the prophecy concerning the Messiah. The Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2. The works of Christ not only declared him to be the Messiah, but showed in what manner his kingdom was to be established. To John was opened the same truth that had come to Elijah in the desert when a great and strong wind rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, God spoke to the prophet by a still small voice. 1 Kings 19, 11 and 12. So, Jesus was to do his work, not with the clash of arms and the overturning of thrones and kingdoms, but through speaking to the, to the hearts of men by a life of mercy and self-sacrifice. And note the words that John was opened the same truth which came to Elijah. In other words, there, there came an unfolding at this point of great and wonderful truths to John the Baptist's mind. His mind was carried back to the experience of Elijah and he recognised that Elijah's experience was a prophetic picture of the way in which the Messiah would do his work. Not by earthquakes, not by great fires, not by mighty winds, not by the clash of arms and the use of force, but by a still small voice would the work of Christ be done. Now what was happening was this, that through all this trial and, and tribulation that John faced, the spirit in him, the spirit of love, the spirit of holiness, the spirit of obedience, the spirit of faith, kept him anchored to the Saviour during this time of stress and trial. And while he was anchored to the Saviour, time and opportunity was provided in which the wrong ideas and theories should be corrected. So when those men came back from visiting Jesus Christ, they came back with a report which showed John the Baptist the true nature of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. It showed, as I read the other night, the manner of Christ's kingdom and the way in which it was to be established. And then those errors were wiped out of John's mind. He came to understand the kingdom of God as it really was. And that cut off an avenue of temptation whereby Satan had been previously able to attack John and cause him great difficulty and trouble which again emphasises the point of course that being in every, every um, being correct in every point of truth is not so important as having a very very close union with God through communication with him day by day so I pass on now to page 218 and we'll now see what John further saw and what response this brought from his heart as a result 218 the principle of the Baptist's own life of self-abnegation was the principle of the Messiah's kingdom. Now John saw that. He now saw that what was in him, the spirit in him, was the same spirit that was in the kingdom and in the Saviour who brought that kingdom. And when John saw that, then he well knew how foreign all this was to the principles and hopes of the, of the leaders in Israel. That which was to him convincing evidence of Christ's divinity would, would be no evidence to them. They were looking for a Messiah who had not been promised. John saw that the Saviour's mission would win, could win from them only hatred and condemnation. He, the forerunner, was but drinking the cup which Christ himself must drain to his dregs. He said, what's all there is to it, he said. It's very, very apparent to me now that the spirit in myself and the spirit in Jesus Christ is foreign to the scribes and the Pharisees. And because it is, there'll be a warfare between the life of Christ and the Pharisees and so forth with whom he is in conflict. And therefore, all I'm experiencing now, John the Baptist said, is not to be wondered at, it's the natural outworking of, these, of this controversy. And John then relaxed and rested in the fact that he was but suffering the same things that Christ himself would later suffer and which sufferings were necessary in order to achieve the building of the kingdom of God. 
And I, I like the beautiful spirit of acceptance and submission which we find emerging in the life of John the Baptist at this time. And this to me is an assurance that if I am careful to maintain a union with Jesus Christ, then all these other problems will take care of themselves in due time. That, that's a very certain thing. Establish the cause and you'll get the desired effect. Don't try and establish the effect. Just establish the cause and the effect will take care of itself. The next paragraph now says, The Saviour's words, Blessed is he, whosoever shall find none occasion of stumbling in me, were a gentle reproof to John. It was not lost upon him. Understanding more clearly now the nature of Christ's mission, he yielded himself to God for life or for death as would best serve the interests of the cause he loved. Now take this word yielded. What's another word that you could use in the place of yielded? Submitted. Submitted. That's the word I was looking for. Submitted. Now one of the most beautiful words in respect to Christian experience to me is the word submission. Submission. And submission means yielding, it means surrender, it means total acceptance of whatever God should choose for our best good. And more importantly, of course, for the best good of his kingdom. The next few pages, of course, cover the story of the beheading of John the Baptist. And we've already observed that God gave him a far greater gift by letting him die and being raised again than if he had been left if he'd been released from the prison where he was. Let's now turn across to page 224 to read some concluding remarks about the death of John the Baptist and God's purpose in that, um, in that death. Jesus did not interpose to deliver his servant. He knew that John would bear the test. Gladly would the Saviour have come to John to brighten the dungeon, gloom with his own presence, but he was not to place himself in the hands of enemies and imperil his own mission. Gladly would he have delivered his faithful servants, but for the sake of thousands, who in after years must pass from prison to death, John was to drink the cup of martyrdom. As the followers of Jesus should languish in lonely cells, or perish by the sword, the rack, or the faggot, apparently forsaken by God and man, what a state of their hearts would be the thought that John the Baptist, to whose faithfulness Christ himself had borne witness, had passed through a similar experience. And of course, as the uh, martyrs of the Middle Ages would languish in prison cells, the devil would come to them and tempt them to believe that their own unfaithfulness had put them there. If they'd only been a little more faithful, maybe they would not be in prison. But when they could look back and see that John the Baptist, whom Satan had not been able to bring into sin, but who had Christ's personal witness of his greatness and, and righteousness, had passed to a similar fate, what a comfort and stay that proved to be to many a soul, and many a soul who otherwise might have let go, hung on because of John the Baptist's witness in death um, as a martyr. Now then we, we come on to the next paragraph or two. Satan was permitted to cut short the earthly life of God's messenger, but that life which is hid with Christ in God the destroyer could not reach. He exulted that he had brought sorrow upon Christ, but he had failed of conquering John. Death itself only placed him further beyond the power of temptation. In this warfare, Satan was revealing his own character before the witnessing universe he made manifest his enmity toward God and man. Though no miraculous deliverance was granted John, he was not forsaken. He had always the companionship of heavenly angels who opened to him the prophecies concerning Christ and the precious promises of Scripture. These were his stay, as they were to be the stay of God's people throughout the coming ages. To John the Baptist, as to those who came after him, was given the, the assurance, Lo, I am with you all the days, even unto the end. Now I like this final paragraph, which is a, uh, a, an endorsement of submission. It is because we believe what these words say that we have no trouble submitting ourselves to God. God never leads his children Otherwise, they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. Not Enoch, who was translated to heaven, not Elijah, who ascended in a chariot of fire, was greater or more honoured than John the Baptist who perished alone in the dungeon. Unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him but also to suffer for his sake. And of all the gifts that heaven can bestow upon men, 
Fellowship with Christ and his sufferings is the most weighty trust and the highest honour. If you were to talk to John the Baptist today, as you'll soon have the privilege of doing anyway, if faithful of course, and were to ask him the question now, what do you think now about being left to die in that dungeon? What will he say? I rejoice that God gave me that gift of sacrifice and witness. That is the very thing he would have chosen for himself if he could have seen the end from the beginning and could have discerned the glory of the purpose he was fulfilling as a co-worker with Christ. Now the life of John the Baptist, as is also the life of Jesus Christ, is a very, very beautiful witness to the results of a life of communion with God. It's a very, very beautiful witness of that. And um, it assures to us, of course, that um, we likewise can rise to the same glorious heights that, that he arose to. We now return to the life of Jesus Christ on page 109 in the same book, Desire of Ages, 109. And this chapter, of course, is called The Baptism. We'll read the first paragraph because it does bring to light a very important principle of holiness in the life of Jesus. And the first paragraph says, Tidings of the wilderness prophet had, and his wonderful announcement spread throughout Galilee. The message reached the peasants in the remotest hill towns, the fisher folk by the sea, and in these simple earnest hearts found his truest response. In Nazareth it was told in the carpenter's shop that had been Joseph's and one recognised the call his time had come turning from his daily toil he bade farewell to his mother and followed in the, in the steps of his countrymen who were flocking to the Jordan Jesus Christ at this point of time is 30 years of age and no doubt he understood the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 very clearly if not at this point of time he did very shortly afterwards because as you read in Mark the first chapter the disciples and he went around preaching that time is fulfilled based upon the prophecy of Daniel chapter uh, 8 and verse 4 um, chapter 9 rather which deal with the 70 weeks of the 490 years that stretched down to the end of the Jews opportunity to be men and women of God and the 483 years of course stretched down to the time when Christ would begin his work as the Messiah and we need to appreciate the fact that um, Jesus Christ had come to understand his mission 18 years before. At the age of 12, the mystery of his mission had begun to open before the Saviour. And Jesus Christ had become a person of considerable spiritual power. And while no one could say a miracle had been performed, as we read on the, um, the previous page, no, I beg your pardon, it's not the previous page, in the, in the chapter before one we're looking at now, back on page 92, no one could say that he had worked a miracle, but virtue, the healing power of love, went out from him to the sick and distressed. So had a miracle been worked in actual fact? Mm -hmm. Most definitely. So Christ was a miracle worker in a very quiet way while he was still but a youth and a young man. Now possessed of that kind of power and filled with a consuming love for perishing mankind all around him, and there, was, there were plenty of those, there were thousands upon thousands of folk going down to Christless graves, would there have been a temptation uh, upon Jesus Christ to step out before his time had come and begin to preach the gospel? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But he waited. He would not move until he had the divine order, until the Spirit of God said to him, now is the time. And not until that time came would Jesus Christ step out from the carpenter shop and begin his life work. Now remember this, that we're searching to find the practical ways in which Jesus Christ lived out a life of perfect obedience. And many people think, well, some people have a real um, passion for going out and doing missionary work, which of course is very commendable. We all need that kind of passion. Well, at the present time, we need to be very content to be in school, don't we? That's the more important thing at the present moment. And they're so burdened with the need to go out and help the poor and needy, the sick and the dying, to preach the gospel, that they set themselves very specific goals. Now, for instance, I know a man in this movement still, although he doesn't really understand and he doesn't accept the Sabbath rest message completely, he has made a, he has made a vow that he will never, ever let a person be in his presence for more than 10 minutes before he preaches the gospel to him. That's his rule which of course I don't think is a correct procedure at all because that person, we might meet a person that um, 
He's not ready to hear the gospel yet. Maybe all he needs is a friendly uh, atmosphere for a few minutes, a nice social little visit that lays down the foundation for a future opening up of the gospel. And sometimes, of course, we may never ever talk to that person again. Somebody else may do the talking to that person. And um, it is not a manifestation of holiness to set yourself a work out there amongst perishing mankind. It's not, it's not for you to say, I've just got to get out there and help those people. It's for you to say, what are my divine orders? And if God says to you, stand still at the moment and wait, then what do we do? We wait until our time comes. As um, Samuel said to Saul, to obey is better than what? Sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. And that's a principle which uh, King Saul never learned. And because of it, of course, he lost both his present life and also his eternal life. So um, Jesus Christ's time had come. He heard the voice of God speaking to him and he went down to the water he went down to see John the Baptist at the waters of the Jordan and he asked for baptism. We move on now to um, page 110, the very next page, Desire of Ages, 110. And we'll now read about the revelation that God gave to Jesus Christ at this time of what he was to face in order to achieve his divinely appointed mission. And by laying open before Jesus Christ at this point of time what lay before him, Christ was given the opportunity of either confirming his dedication to God or turning his back upon that mission. God does that when he calls a worker, at least he did in my experience. Remember back in 1961 when the call came to me to stand out in full-time work? The Lord... Um, as I contemplated that call there, there, there ran before my eyes a very accurate picture I say accurate because I've had time to check the picture in the last 20 years 22 years now and I saw something of what doing God's work would cost him and I saw I said I don't want that kind of life and began to back off then another picture came before my eyes, the picture of Foss and Foy, those two men whom God called to be prophets before Sister White was called, and what became of them when they refused the call of God. So I don't want that either. And I decided then that um, which was the lesser of the two evils. So this is the picture of Christ being shown very accurately and comprehensively just what lay before him. But first of all, a word about the reaction of John the Baptist to Christ's request for baptism. Page 110. When Jesus came to be baptized, John recognized in him a purity of character he had never before perceived in any man. The very atmosphere of his presence was holy and awe-inspiring. Among the multitudes that had gathered about him at the Jordan, John had heard dark tales of crime and had met souls bowed down with the burden of myriad sins, but never, but never had he come in contact with a human being from whom there breathed an influence so divine. All this was in harmony with that which had been revealed to John regarding the Messiah. Yet he shrank from granting the request of Jesus. How could he, a sinner, baptize the sinless one? And why should, he, why should he, who needed no repentance, submit to a rite which was a confession of guilt to be washed away? As Jesus asked for baptism, John drew back exclaiming, I have need to be baptized of thee and comest out of me. To firm Yet gentle authority, Jesus answered, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And John, yielding, led the Saviour down into the Jordan and buried him beneath the water. And straightway coming up out of the water, Jesus saw the heavens opened and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And we'll learn, of course, that um, there were several reasons for this manifestation of divine approval in, in, in the shape of this dove the descent of the Holy Spirit upon him. One was, of course, the, um, the fact that um, Jesus Christ needed this endowment of the Spirit to fit him now for service. We understand that the Spirit of God comes to us in three stages. The first stage is an outward working upon us to bring to us conviction, to soften our hearts, to, to create desires for us to reach out and lay hold upon the power of God. Then when this work outside has been affected the Holy Spirit then enters into us to implant the divine seed after cleansing out the old evil nature That's, so first of all the Spirit works on us then he, then he enters into us and then thirdly he endows us with power to go forth and preach the gospel as took place at Pentecost 
and that is the work of the Holy Spirit through us. <coughs> now, very obviously, of course, the Spirit cannot work through a person unless he has first entered into that person, nor can he enter into a person unless he's first of all worked upon that person to effect a true and a genuine repentance. And so, Jesus Christ, of course, within whom the Spirit of God had certainly been abiding up to this point of time, now received a special endowment whereby he'd go forth and be a true Messiah, a true Redeemer, a true Saviour for all mankind. In addition to that, of course, it was given to confirm the faith of John the Baptist, and also Christ's faith as well. And thirdly, although much less successfully, it was designed to reach out and give to the multitude a witness that this was in fact the sent of God. As we shall read as we go along in subsequent study periods, the multitude looking on were so spiritually blind, so apostate, so devoted to a kingdom of glory and power, that they were not able to recognize the manifestation of God's presence and spirit at this point of time. <clears throat> now, time has but gone, so I'll have to read just a little bit uh, to, to take up the last two minutes, and then we'll move on to, further into this when we come back tomorrow. And uh, note the marvelous dedication along the principles of holiness which Christ gave upon coming up out of the waters of baptism. Let's read in just a little bit now on page 111 of the book Desire of Ages. Upon coming up out of the water, Jesus bowed and prayed on the river bank. A new and important era was opening before him. He was now upon a wider stage entering on the conflict of his life. Now it doesn't say he was now entering on the conflict of his life, does it? But, but he was entering how? On a wider stage. In other words, all the pressures, all the opposition, all the unbelief, all the misunderstanding, all the accusations, all the contempt, all the despiteful usage he'd gone through in the previous 30 years was but a taste or a sampling of what he was yet to face in the next three and a half years of his life. The same thing, only on a wider stage. The same thing to a deep intensity. The same thing in brutal lines. The same thing, of course, in more searching power to test him to the absolute uttermost to see if he could maintain his faith and submission in God. And so this was a very important moment in the life of Jesus Christ when he was entering upon a wider stage on the conflict of his life. Though he was the Prince of Peace, his coming must be as the unsheathing of the sword. The kingdom he had come to establish was the opposite of that which the Jews desired. He who was the foundation of the ritual and economy of Israel would be looked upon as his enemy and destroyer. him. He who had proclaimed the law upon Sinai would be condemned as a transgressor. He would come to break the power of Satan would be denounced as Beelzebub. No one upon earth had understood him and during his ministry he must still walk alone. Throughout his life, his mother and his brothers did not comprehend his mission. Even his disciples did not understand him. He had dwelt in eternal light as one with God, but his life on earth must be spent in solitude. And that was a very, very hard burden, a heavy cross for Jesus Christ to bear. Now, he saw all that at this point of time, as we, read, as we, as we shall read tomorrow, and yet despite the fact that he saw it all and understood the sacrifice and pain involved, he's, he's determined to do God's will in God's way remain steadfast and in this way he shows us the pathway to a holy life. My time has gone, I guess, so I'll have to stop at this point. Any questions you might like to ask, any questions you'd like to have discussed? Very good, let's take the closing hymn this evening.